Hello everyone, welcome to another Journal Club with Vestibular First. We're excited for our topic tonight, and it is about effective patient education strategies for vestibular conditions. So this gives us an opportunity to have three amazing guests with us. Uh, we have Madison Oak and Daniel Tolman and Deja Crippen, who are all excellent physical therapists, doctorates, etc., brilliant people. And I'm going to let them, each of them introduce themselves a little bit more in depth. We'll start with you, Madison. Hi, I'm Madison. Um, I live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I'm a vestibular physical therapist, um, just like the rest of these lovely humans. And I like to treat vestibular migraine and persistent postural perceptual dizziness the most. Those are my favorite things to see on someone's referral or that they're telling me. Um, I just love how much people can progress and change. Um, I have a telehealth clinic in eight states, and I also run a group program that's available internationally. So people who don't have access to vestibular rehab or for financial reasons or for they live in a rural area reasons or anything like that, any reason you can think of so people can get equitable um, services and understand their vestibular disorder better and work towards management of those chronic disorders as well. Um, that's called the Stabular Group Fit, and I'm the Vertigo Doctor on Instagram, and I'm launching a podcast in September called Grounded, and it is a patient-forward podcast for people with vestibular disorders, which I think is going to be really exciting and fun. That awesome. is fantastic. Well, thank you. And Danielle, heads up for you. Sure. My name is Danielle Tolman. I'm a vestibular physical therapist and true vestibular colic. Um, I love, love, love patient education. It's one of the things that uh, I find a lot of passion and value in. Um, so one of the things that I did right out of school was start collecting resources for clinicians who wanted to start specialize and create them on a website called vestibular.today. Um, where then I also crossed paths with uh, Helena and Patrick, and we got into the realm of creating 3D educational models and, and putting our heads together to create cool clinician and patient educational tools. Um, I also have a podcast called Talk Dizzy to Me, where we interview experts in the field and have other additional guests like the wonderful Vertigo Doctor to talk about uh, different topics in the vestibular world. I treat in an outpatient clinic, um, seeing vestibular patients, and I also treat telehealth in a couple of different states. Um, I was also very heavily involved with the Vestibular Disorders Association, and I'm just really, really excited to be here with you guys to talk about all of these uh, really cool educational resources that we have for our clinicians and patients. Fantastic. All right. Last but certainly not least, Deja, go ahead. Hi, everybody. So I am Deja Crippen. I currently am a travel physical therapist located in Delaware. I will be relocating to um, Philadelphia, and that's where I went to school. And that's where I met Helena. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's been nice. Um, and actually being able to have this opportunity to come on here with so many uh, prestigious women like this is great. So thank you for inviting me on. Um, I'm a part of the vestibular SIG. I've been there for about three going on three years now. Um, and so I just love all things vestibular. If I could treat it all the time, I, all, every day I would, but I treat everything. So not just vestibular right now. So. Yeah. And, and that's actually good. I mean, I had, of course, many reasons to invite you all on here and not the least of which I think you bring diverse experiences and perspectives. Um, you know, we've all had different sorts of patients we've treated, different um, settings that we've worked in. And I think it provides a really good opportunity to talk about you know, how, you know, why I might choose one strategy with a certain patient uh, based on their characteristics versus somebody else, uh, or are we trying to educate a family member versus, you know, someone who, um, you know, maybe needs additional support, they're blind. I mean, I've had almost, not everything, but a lot. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think this is a great opportunity to bring you all on here. So we're so grateful to have you. So we're going to dig right into the first couple slides on every journal club that I have are the same because I want to make sure everyone's on the same page who's viewing this. So we love the vestibular system. Why? Well, it's our inner ear balance sensor. It is also sometimes called the vestibular apparatus and it helps us know where we are. It is neighbors with all of our hearing structures. Um, so sometimes when there's pathologies, both will be involved, but not always. And um, it's, you know, embedded deep in our inner ear of our uh, bone structure on each side, left and right, we have one. And then that 
vestibular sensor that we love so much is connected via nerve to the brain. And that's important because we need information from that sensor to go uh, work with information from our eyes and the information from our joints. Um, and hearing, everything needs to work, hopefully, as a team. This is a sensory integration, some people call it, um, so that our brain is like, all right, we're standing upright. Oh, we're actually leaning to the side or what have you, right? So this is really essential because uh, to, to feel safe, <laughs> our brain wants to know where it is in space and what's happening. Are we moving? Are we still? That sort of thing. So this is why we care so much about the system because it has a vast impact on our daily function, our ability to perform daily tasks, be athletic, and um, feel well. <laughs> and when it's having some sort of issue at the vestibular sensor level, at the brain level, both sometimes, um, this is where we can run into some various symptoms. So I did choose out an article. It's not the main focus of this talk. It's really a light article, but um, I wanted to talk about it because um, it talks about uh, one strategy for vestibular education. Um, so in general, um, if someone has some sort of vestibular symptom, dizziness, vertigo, sense of spinning, disorientation, imbalance, uh, this can result uh, or contribute to a feeling of anxiety. <laughs> like, whoa, what's going on? Am I, I have a brain tumor? <laughs> this is where people tend to go, which is understandable because you know, those are scary conditions that we wouldn't want to ignore or not get checked out and addressed, right? Um, and so they did a study where they had patients with either current or suspected benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, which is little tiny crystals in our inner ear sensor that go in the wrong part. And we'll talk more about that shortly. <laughs> um, and they had a fluid bottle, which I readily admit, and I know this seems self-interested, but this is the first article I've ever covered <laughs> that was actually done on, not by us, by a totally independent university. We didn't even know they were doing it. They used our fluid model, <laughs> made by vestibular first, um, but I am pretty proud, I'm not gonna lie, um, to see if it could help patients have a better understanding of their condition and ideally experience less anxiety as a result. Um, so they utilized this model for half of the folks in the study and the other half they did not utilize it when they were educating their patients about the dizziness and the cause of it and the pathology of BPPV. And on their post-survey data, so just kind of report back from the patients, you know, how did they feel about it? Um, they felt that they had more understanding of their symptom etiology, increased comfort level with preventing their symptoms, a decrease in symptom-related anxiety, and um, basically the people who were able to use this fluid model as part of their educational experience had um, some positive results. So this is a very tiny study, okay? We got eight folks in the control group, eight in the experimental group. Um, this group has already talked about doing more studies using it, so hopefully we'll get more data uh, to see if this holds up uh, with a larger group. So, you know, if not, that's okay. I wanna, I wanna have straight data, like that's, I love facts. <laughs> um, but it was promising and exciting, and it certainly relates to my personal experience as a clinician, um, that I think having different tools can help a patient you know, uh, kind of have a better experience. So having summarized that study in full, <laughs> we are going to dig into the meat of today's talk. So I wanted to start out with some language. So I've already kind of alluded to some analogies and terms that I use when I try to explain, and I did so in the beginning um, <laughs> with the vestibular system and the brain and how they all work together. Uh, but I wanted to have each of you kind of talk uh, just briefly about why you like a certain term, and some of these were very overlapped, which I think is encouraging perhaps, <laughs> that we all kind of find certain terms useful. Well, let's start with, the, start with the vestibular apparatus itself. So I already used the term inner ear balance sensor. That's what I tend to use. Um, I'm just gonna go kind of through the line here. So Deja is next on the column. So tell me about why you like inner ear system. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't fully think about the balance system being in your ear at all. So I think as soon as I tell them, oh, all right, it's the inner ear system, then there's like, huh, there's something else to this. Okay, great. And Madison, what? tell me about this cable box idea. It only really makes sense if I go all the way down. Okay, go ahead. Go all the way down. I mean, so, 
<laughs> so a cable box and a television and a cable wire is something that I think most people are very concretely familiar with. Like I know that like it goes somehow from my satellite dish or whatever on my building somewhere maybe, and it goes to my cable box and that thing transmits to my television. So I like to use this example of a cable box as your vestibular system. It's taking in information and it is just spitting it into a cable, which is your vestibular cochlear nerve, connecting your cable to your television. And then your television is your brain. So it kind of puts all of those things together and it spits out a picture. Mm -hmm. And within there, you can kind of go into the fact that when this happens, there can be an issue at any one of those regions. Like you can have a broken cable, you can have a broken box, you can have a broken television, but it's still creating static. It's still creating these issues at the end of the day that you're processing. So it seems like, oh, it's just my television, but you have to get a TV guy to come over and say, oh, actually it's your cable box or actually it's the way you're interpreting this basically. So that is why I do cable box, cable and television. I think it's really concrete, which people appreciate. Okay. Well, while we're in your column, what about the seaweed and fluid fill sensor um, so tube situation? For, <laughs> yeah. So so if you're talking about your cupula and it kind of moving back and forth in something, I'm from California. I don't live there anymore, but I'm from California and anything I can relate to the ocean is my thing. So it kind of moves like seaweed you would imagine coming up from an ocean floor. And when there's a riptide one way or a tide the other way, it kind of moves with it. And that is the direction of where you are. Um, and then the other one, oh, your canal is just fluid filled sensor tubes. And I kind of go into what and a lymph and perilymph are a little bit those types of fluid in your tubes, but kind of how they move and those kind of act as the ocean for your seaweed. Awesome. Perfect. All right. So I also have tiny tubes full of fluid. So obviously I jive there. Um, <laughs> I have done seaweed, but I have to say sometimes I find certain people relate more to a trampoline. So that is another way I've gone. Um, I like to know that it's blocking the tube all the way around and that it does kind of mm -hmm. have the ability to kind of come in or out and deflect in certain ways that can create different sensations. I like the telephone wire or cable. I do think people usually, even though we're all wireless today in some ways, uh, <laughs> you know, we still kind of have to charge our phones and things. So cables still kind of, you know, and they know about broken cables for sure. <laughs> so that I agree with. And I think processing center I saw for Danielle I'm a, a computer that processes movement for the brain kind of these different ways I think the television kind of hits that as well just kind of kind of a you have mother load which I also love Daisha um, so different ways to kind of say that's the the main event the the, the mothership the, the, the center uh, of information processing so awesome and I'm going to let uh, Good, Daisha, you want to hit up anything else that, in your column that you want to explain or describe a little more why you like that terminology for some of these other things? Well, I, you explained the mother load very well, um, but I'm going to say I'm going to take some of Madison's, uh, you know, that that's pretty good. So I think I'm going to take <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, Madison's is a pretty uh, tough act to follow. Um, I just <laughs> kind of like you had mentioned with the trampoline, I like um, having patients picture a sail just because the sail is attached to the bottom of the rig as well as the top of the mast, like it is from the bottom of the canal to the top of the canal in that ampulated portion. So I like that that uh, idea of that, that sail billowing side to side. But again, I love the seaweed analogy too. I think a lot of people on the East Coast uh, down where I am can also relate to that. For sure. So I think people's life experience, certainly, um, I might have some very young folk that might not jive with the television thing. They're all on their phones now. So we might have to come away from that at some point. But I, I think it's it's absolutely right to kind of fit it to the individual and, and the case. Like, actually, I like the trampoline, too, because then when I talk about um, a form of BPPV where the little otoconia, those little crystals kind of attach or possibly lodge onto the cupula, um, and I talk about it giving weight and why it might kind of change how you feel a little differently than if they were floating and moving in the tube and why I'm doing a certain maneuver to, to free them or not. If I need to get into that for some folk, I don't. But, you know, so that might be a way I choose that uh, analogy for that case. So. Um, all right. Perfect. So now. Um, this is a, a lot of words. So um, just think of this as a big resource page for everybody. Um, and there's definitely some overlap between us, um, which I think is another sign to some of the resources that we all consistently find useful. 
Uh, but there's also variety, which is what I wanted because I think there might be something that I don't use that I'm like, oh, I'm going to you know, use that more. So um, I'm going to start with my column first just because I'm there first in line. So when I'm explaining BPPV, I do love to use the fluid filled apparatus, I have to admit. I feel like a lot of people like to put it in their hand. They like to see the crystals move. They can relate to that. Um, that visual and tactile input uh, can help them understand. There are some good videos online. I named one of my favorites there, which is Understand BBV in One Minute with Mike Victatiado, uh, who's a wonderful physician actually in Delaware. Um, <laughs> if I want to explain vestibular neuritis, uh, I have some language for that, but just from a video perspective, um, for those who are not aware, watching the Balance and Dizziness uh, Canada YouTube has tons of really excellent, well-explained videos on various vestibular pathology. Um, so the neuritis is one of the ones I definitely like, uh, but you can find others on there as well. So I do recommend checking that out. Um, and then vestibular, vestibular migraine and triple PD and some other, you know, kind of central vestibular issues you might run into. Um, in addition to the Balance and Dizziness Canada, there is neuroophthalmo ophthalmology with Dr. Andrew Lee. I think he's a little more clinical, maybe better for clinicians than patients, but if you're wanting to understand something better, which can help you break it down to explain it better, which I know I've gone through many times as I've tried to understand these conditions better, I just wanted to name out that resource. Um, he does like kind of like a quick marker drawing with some explanations for some pathologies that I do enjoy. So those are some of my resources that are, are some favorites. Deja, I saw you have some other ones. You want to go through some of yours that I didn't name out? Um, so for BPVB, um, I do use a lot of hand movements all the time. So I'm always like, okay, either here, anterior, posterior canals, or the latter ones, and I go like this, and then I'm, the fluid's moving through it. And then I'll just um, talk about that from that standpoint so that they can see um, but then I will say the vestibular SIG has lots of fact sheets on each of these. So I'm quick to go to the website and just either print out a fact sheet um, so that the patient could understand it. Um, and MedBridge as well. I'll download um, or print out from MedBridge like a BPBV or a vestibular hypofunction example for them. Education piece. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Madison, what are your two cents here? Yeah. So for BPPV, I love a fluid filled apparatus. I will say that I don't see any patients in person. I saw one in person actually for BPPV last week and I was like, this is a good time. <laughs> um, but in general, I'm very telehealth-y um, because I am just seeing people so frequently across the country. So um, with that, I usually Google vestibular system and I have a couple of my favorite pictures that pop up that I use every single time. I think I go through the same educational spiel of what is your vestibular system, how it works, and then like very briefly, and then how it applies to what's going on with you right now. Um, and those hand motions that Deja was using, I use the exact same ones. Like there's something here and it tilts forward, it tilts up, or it, depending on which way you your body is moving and helps you with those def different planes of um, angular motion that they help so much with us understanding. So yeah, I think I'm on the same page here. Awesome. All right, Danielle. All right. I love my fluid filled and my functional inner ear model, especially with the one with the, the little rings attached to it, the mm. kind of more quickly kind mm -hmm. of pull somebody through maneuvers and demonstrate with orientation, especially since the nice little upgrades that uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick Esmond had put together um, showing orientation and, and uh, anatomical positioning of everything. So that's been helpful. I also put together a a very short four slide PowerPoint presentation mm. since we're always documenting on our computers anyways. I have a really quick uh, thing, which we'll actually go through here in a couple of minutes of what I kind of include in that to demonstrate what patients could experience through um, treatment if we test positive for anything that day. Um, for hypofunction, using lots of hands to show firing uh, or excitability of vestibular systems and maybe the visual uh, of kinking a garden hose and cutting off the flow of information between mm. the inner ear and its brain, the processing center. And then when it comes to central issues, you know, there's a lot of great resources. I love Dr. Uh, Michael Tashido's uh, resource page and his uh, more than a headache um, article that he wrote to introduce people to vestibular migraine. And then just also having patients picture that there's a, this neurological storm preventing information from getting where it needs to go. And this is why everybody can vary so much in symptoms. So mm -hmm. very much along the same lines as you guys. I love the vestibular SIG. I love uh, vestibular.org with Vita. There's just so many great resources out there that it's it's fun to use them all with patients. 100%. 
And nobody mentioned yet, but I wanted to throw in a VOR. Uh, it has its pros and cons, there's no question. But uh, a pro about it is, I think, for maybe telehealth or for some reason, you have somebody who's a little more app savvy and really wants to kind of dig into like, well, what, what do you mean what's turning on and off? And the hands just aren't doing it for them. This does provide some of that visual um, because they show kind of with the head movements, different stimulation of, you know, an inhibition of the canals. It also can, again, be helpful for the clinician, I feel, if you're kind of still trying to kind of orient yourself and get comfortable with that. So just wanted to show that up as well as another resource. All right. So, um, yep. Sorry about that. Just want to go to this next slide. So. Sometimes we need uh, some other strategies. So we have patients and they're just not kind of clicking with the treatment. So this is an example that I wanted to show where we can use music as a way to help patients. So I saw, you know, you guys might mention a, a metronome app to help people move their head at a certain speed when we get to treatment. We'll dig into that more. But, you know, I wanted to, you know, mention now uh, that, you know, there are lots of songs that are the proper kind of speed, this approximate 120 beats per minute. Um, I had made a brief list for a social media post, but um, I'm sure that y'all could find more if you knew somebody liked a certain style of music. Again, we want to kind of connect with the patient, figure out what they're into. I don't know if there's a lot of opera songs at this speed, but I can tell you there are plenty of country pop um, and uh, kind of stuff that was made in the 50s, stuff that was made, you know, within the last year. So you could definitely utilize that as a tool. Um, and while we're talking about kind of some of our other resources, already Deja and um, I think Danielle also mentioned the Vestibular SIG or the Vestibular Special Interest Group, which is under the Academy of Neurologic Physical Therapy, which is under the American Physical Therapy Association. So if you're wondering where online to find those, <laughs> APTA.org, I believe. Um, you should be able to find their fact sheets are fabulous. So in addition to those fact sheets, there's also wonderful fact sheets uh, by VEDA, which is the Vestibular Disorders Association, and um, balanceanddizziness.org also has um, some nice information. So I like physical, you know, like I said, print it out, maybe just email it as a PDF to somebody, just like it depends on whether you're in-person telehealth, what does that person relate to? I have patients who only want paper, I tell you. Like, they're just still very attached <laughs> to paper. They do not want to be on anything. So you've got your range there. <laughs> um, and again, some people, like, it benefits them to see it more than one way or to get it more than one way. So uh, we can think about that as well. Um, other favorites I have, um, dailybalance.com. Megan Daly has a few nice... Uh, free handouts as well. I mentioned the AVOR app that I showed you. Um, if you want to look at videos, like, what was that maneuver again? <laughs> um, of course, vestibular.today has um, some very nice resources as well as for general vestibular exercises. I have found the University of Michigan has put up some nice um, paper handout PDFs and videos. Um, so, and those handouts also could be useful if you want to give your patient the occasional home maneuver for BPV or something like that. So I definitely go to those. Deja, what else you got? Yeah, um, you kind of hit them, <laughs> the first two anyway, for diagnosis and in general with VEDA. Um, but for treatment, yeah, I use MedBridge. I, there's a lot of stuff that you can print out when it comes to like changing the surface or a lot of the VOR training on there. Um, and I do use the metronome app. And then when you were talking about the um, AVOR, I, I completely forgot about that, but I do have that on my phone too. Great. Perfect. Yeah, it's a lot to remember. Trust me, I feel you. Uh, <laughs> Madison, anything else you want to speak to on their list? Um, yeah, shameless plug. My website and YouTube also have tons of information for patients, just like everyone else does. I think finding like which one your patient clicks with. Sometimes I'll send them my stuff. Sometimes I'll send them vestibular sig. It really depends kind of on their mm -hmm. needs and levels. Um, and then I, I think, oh, Danielle has it on hers, but victory over vestibular migraine mm -hmm. for all of the patients by Dr. Bay is absolutely excellent. And then he also has a new one called disembark about MDDS. Um, and I think that can also be helpful for people who are rocking and swaying because of MDDS mm -hmm. um, as well. 
But other than that, you got them all. (laughs) (laughs) All right. That's wonderful. And anything else you want to add there, Danielle? Um, I mean, the only other thing that I have potentially geared towards clinicians is a couple of different history algorithms Mm. uh, for the clinician. So one is more general, you know, starting at the top, you can kind of uh, look at a patient's history and their presentation and follow it down to both peripheral and central uh, possible uh, dysfunctions or um, diagnoses, as well as one that was created purely for BPPD. And um, that is just based on BPPD presentation, which canal is involved or which um, treatment techniques can be recommended for each of those. Uh, so that's one that's just more clinician based. Um, again, I give out Dr. Michael Tachado's more than a migraine, uh, he- more than a headache for migraine literature. That's a little bit less daunting mm-hmm. um, and just a good educational resource that's constantly being updated. And then, you know, a specific meditation app or even uh, my newest is the uh, cervical cradle that you can find on Amazon for like a whole $20 to help with suboccipital release and and better posture, which I've been finding has been really helpful for patients. So I have a nice little handout I just print out and and give out uh, to each patient that I think would be appropriate for. Awesome. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right. Rife with ideas here. So I just pulled these slides together to give everybody who's not familiar a quick visual example. So this is a visual example. For example, uh, someone's already pointed out to me on my social media that it should be vestibular migraine and not migraines. But we will forgive that this was written probably a bit ago. Um, and the, and that's the thing that everyone has to remember, I think, whether you're a clinician or a patient. You know, the literature is always evolving and the resources try to keep up, but it is difficult. Um, You know, most of the people who are doing these resources are clinicians. We're all seeing patients. And so please be gentle um, and understand we're doing our best and hopefully always trying to improve. Um, But I, I would say, again, like I think Madison alluded to, sometimes a patient wants like a full page to read and sometimes that would be too much. Sometimes a patient wants a video to watch. Sometimes that's like just too visually like stimulating actually. So it really depends um, on kind of the patient's temperament, um, their interests, their kind of the way they are, the kind of learner they are, I guess is the way I was taught in school. You can be more hands-on, you want to be more auditory, or do you just want to read or visual, you know. So you can kind of try to click into that based on trying to figure out you know, in the past, how's the patient maybe learned or what are you just kind of observing about their behaviors? Are they immediately on their phone the whole time? <laughs> like that might kind of lead you down one path versus another. Um, and I also would say that, you know, some people want more pictures and some people, again, want more words. Um, so just kind of trying to think of all those things when we're trying to provide this education um, and say, oh, well, if that felt a little bit overwhelming to me, you know, which patient is going to be a good fit for that. And some people do just want more. (laughs) Like They want everything. They want all the videos and all the handouts, which, you know, might be good or bad. But we can kind of discern that with our uh, clinical judgment. Um, So we're going to get into some individual explanations of pathologies. We've kind of alluded to some of them already, but I think that's okay. Um, Never hurts to reinforce in my book. So uh, (laughs) I want to start with Danielle, and uh, she's going to just kind of Give us her two cents on how she likes to explain the pathology of this BPPV, which is, of course, the most common um, condition that causes positional vertigo, and you'll hear a lot of people talk about. Uh, so, yeah. So I like uh, I like trying to accommodate all my different types of learners: those who need to read, those who need to just watch and listen, and those who actually need to have hands-on approach. But um, one thing I can recommend is this poster from AnatomyWarehouse.com. I have it um, uh, velcroed up onto my wall so I can pull it down and point out to patients exactly where this inner ear apparatus or vestibular system is, this balance system and distinguish it between the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear, which is encased in bone. So I can uh, um, make them rest easy that they're not going to poke it out with a Q-tip or anything like that. Um, This GIF that came from Dr. Timothy Haynes' website, dizzinessandbalance.com, I use in my PowerPoint slide just to kind of give people an idea of those little crystals falling out. But typically, I just start with the name you know, BPBV, that it's not going to kill you. It happens suddenly with changes in position and it creates this false sense of movement, which can be variable from patient to patient, whether it's room spinning or maybe just a sense of disorientation or imbalance. It can differ greatly from person to person, which is why sometimes it could be missed uh, initially um, in mm-hmm. patients. So, you know, breaking down that anatomy, I talk about 
those otolith organs and their job. And one thing that I really like to hammer home is that these crystals, which uh, surround these little jelly bean looking like organs, which are covered in jelly and then rolled in these crystals, we have them from birth. Um, what you have is what you've got. You can't grow new ones. You can't fortify them. You can't take calcium to try to strengthen them since they're somewhat similar to the makeup of bones. But I like saying that they're similar to the makeup of bone or limestone because uh, it's very similar to how our bones become more brittle as we age. So you can see in you know a younger person, their little crystals under that microscope there are nice and young and healthy, and they're stuck together by these little filaments. And as we get older, they tend to break down, become more brittle. And if they become more brittle and they start to lose those little filaments that hold them on, then they can flake off and they can become detached and sink into these little fluid filled tubes that are like a one way street. They're blocked off by a billowing sail on one end and they have an opening on the other. So those crystals have a job. They tell us where we are um, in space and if we're moving in linear movement. So which way is up and down and if we're moving like in a car or an elevator. And the problem with those crystals, is if they become displaced in those tubes, those tubes basically act as like your gyroscope. They measure head movement from side to side, up and down, or tilting. And that's really important because those movements of those fluid in those inner ear, those little tubes, they communicate to the muscles around your eyeballs. And the reason why I go into all of the different aspects of the vestibular organ is because these little heavy crystals, if they get into these tubes and they roll around when they shouldn't, and they can inappropriately have that, that tube fire become excited when it shouldn't. So now you've got one inner ear telling the brain that you're moving and your eyes start to correct for that movement. And when the other uh, ear is saying, we're not moving, they correct back. And then I like to show in this next slide as an example um, in my little PowerPoint slide, what nystagmus actually looks like. And that kind of gives our patient an idea of why it looks like the room is spinning round and round. So uh, let's go ahead and see that next slide, Lena, if that video will play. Yeah. I usually have something that just shows patients what these eyeballs do. And I use this as an opportunity to tell each patient that every canal in that inner ear has a very specific pattern of movement. So when I dip you back and if I can make you dizzy, the way that I watch those eyeballs dance around will tell me exactly where those crystals are and which canal they're stuck in and how I'm going to get them out of that inner ear. So, um, you know, I like demonstrating what that looks like. Then, of course, you know, I this was at the very beginning, beginning of COVID that I actually filmed a home maneuver um, for patients to give out as a, a way they can treat themselves at home without coming into the clinic. But in this video, um, as an example of how I use one of these uh, functional inner ears, the fluid filled apparatus to really show a patient what's going on and, you know, demonstrating what it looks like every time they recline back in bed or turn over in bed. When they can sit and watch that little ring or the fluid filled, um, you know, crystals move, they can say, oh, that makes sense that as I'm doing that movement, I would get dizzy and I do get dizzy. And then I take that opportunity to walk them through what we would do for a maneuver if they tested positive during testing during that treatment. So now I've got patients cheering when they get dizzy in position three of the epley rather than panicking, thinking I made them work. <laughs> so I will say that, you know, by taking the time, you know, with your history, whether or not a patient sounds like they have BPBV or if their physician, you know, refer them to you for, for BPBV, I think that educating the patient is super important because one, it cuts down on their anxiety during um, the evaluation itself. They're not going to panic that you're making them worse and they can kind of buy into what's going on and feel like they've got control over what's going to happen during that evaluation. So breaking that down step by step, you know, giving them visuals, giving them handouts. That's like, I have a little handout that summarizes everything we talked about. I send them home with, and then I give them a link to the video so that if they want to try testing or positioning at home, um, they can. And then of course, there's always that conversation afterwards. Do we follow post-maneuver precautions, right? And I know that's that was updated a little bit when they, they updated our clinical practice guidelines. So the research says that we don't necessarily have to have post-maneuver restrictions. You know, back when Dr. John Epley came up with the Epley maneuver, he had patients in a cervical collar and not laying down for an entire two weeks. You know, we are way beyond that. We've actually found that to be detrimental. We don't want patients to not sleep comfortably and like we don't want them to have increased fear and anxiety that they're going to undo anything. You know, we want them to have good sleep quality and we want them to move. 
you know, one of the things that we need the brain to do is to compensate and overcome that motion sensitivity and not get into those fear avoidance behaviors. But in some cases, it absolutely is something that we need to do. You know, patients that have some sort of inner ear dysfunction in their history um, may be more susceptible to developing BPPV and they're, they're just more susceptible to having recurrences. Mm-hmm. So if somebody is a, what we call a frequent flyer in the <laughs> clinic, you know, we might want to follow those post maneuver precautions or if they slip out um, really easily and they can uh, have a recurrence, I'll follow some of those post maneuver precautions, especially if I want to avoid the very rare chance of a, a canal conversion and having them, you know, panic that they feel temporarily worse. You know, we, in some cases, it is very much warranted and something that we should follow. And it's going to be on a case by case basis, just using your best clinical decision making. Definitely. All right. No, so for like that, yeah. again, these are just the examples <laughs> of those uh, YouTube video and resources. I will say I can't believe it's been viewed as much and commented as much as, as it has I have one um, that's like 10 minutes long that I give patients that reiterates all of the BBB education and tips and tricks, probably a little dated, and I probably need to film a new one, especially in a much better environment than my crappy uh, apartment uh, back when I lived in Bluffton. But um, it has been useful when patients want to go home and Google how to do this themselves because they think, oh, that was super easy. I could just do this myself. And after poking around the internet and YouTube, there are so many out there that were just wrong. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's this big debate, you know, we want patients doing this at home. And my argument is they're going to regardless, they're going to search out that information somewhere. So I would much, I would feel much better giving my patients the information that I know is correct and accurate and what I pushed in the clinic for them. Um, and then that way, you know, I, I know they're getting their good stuff. <laughs> and then I also created two other little clips for just a left side maneuver, or just a right for those they want to get into the, into the good stuff um, and not listen to me talk too much. <laughs> And then when it comes into some of the other uh, really common types of vestibular dysfunction, including, you know, vestibular neuritis, which creates a hypofunction, I pretty much just tell a patient this could be due to a dormant virus that likes to hang out on that, uh, that nerve that connects your vestibular organ to your brain. And a lot of times it can get kicked off by a preceding upper respiratory infection or GI distress like a stomach bug, where it kind of kicks up that immune response. Your body's looking for something to fight. It finds that dormant, you know, uh, uh, virus sitting on that nerve and attacks it. Um, and the, re- the analogy I give patients is that we're kind of like stepping on a garden. Hose. That nerve has to travel from that inner ear uh, balance system and go up to the brain. And it's got to travel through these little tiny channels in the bone to get there. So if you have inflammation of this nerve that's being attacked and it swells or becomes inflamed, it kind of gets pinched off, limiting that flow of information, just like stepping on that hose. So if we lose that flow of information, then we have a loss in function, which immediately sends you into a tailspin. But we can do some exercises to work on compensation and getting you back on track to feeling a little bit better. Uh, let's see. Oh, and with that vestibular neuritis, you're less likely to have that hearing loss, um, you know, in comparison to something like a labyrinthitis. Um, so again, you know, we're talking about those, there's a ba- imbalance in the signals, your vestibular organs, which are supposed to be firing at the same rate on both sides, constantly bringing information in. If one of them is not working as hard as the other, and it's kind of slacking off a little bit, you're kind of left feeling like you're on this tilt at all times. And the brain does this amazing thing to kind of help take over and compensate. And sometimes we can gain back function with some adaptation on one side. And sometimes we can pull down function on the other and try to get things a little bit more balanced again. So you feel like you can walk around steady in the world, but it does take time to heal. We have to adapt. And those consistency and exercises is super duper important. Now, Meniere's disease Meniere's disease can be tough. Um, There's a lot of education that comes around this. Um, It affects 0.2% of the U.S. population, common um, for 40 and older. Um, It can affect both ears over time. Um, And then there's, it's what's interesting is that there's an equal prevalence between males and females, maybe a little bit more in women than men. And it's got very specific diagnostic criteria. And I use that information to educate my patients about um, their diagnosis. If I have someone that came in who is just diagnosed with uh, Meniere's disease after seeing one doctor one time, uh, we might be a little bit skeptical. So we talk about those those symptoms and the diagnostic criteria. 
Um, and we say, you know, I, I'm so sorry that you got diagnosed with this, and but we're going to keep an eye out on this and make sure we're following the path of this. And here's what this means. But let's look into some other things today and see what we can help with right now. Um, but those four symptoms just include those uh, really horrible spontaneous attacks of vertigo, anywhere from 20 minutes to 24 hours. We want to have um, audiograms or hearing tests that document this low frequency hearing loss, which is very different than our age related, um, you know, high frequency hearing loss. Um, you want to have fluctuation in symptoms as far as fullness or pressure in that ear, especially when you're more symptomatic with your other symptoms. And then we have to rule out everything else, you know, in, in, um, in association with that. So sometimes that might spark the conversation of migraine or other diagnoses, but including those diagnostic criteria, I think helps the patient come to their own conclusion whether or not it sounds like them or not. 100%. And adding in that you unfortunately can get BPPV, mm -hmm. um, particularly on the side that's hemineer. So I thought these patients, well, I thought you ruled everything else out. And I'm like, well, unfortunately, sometimes we have more than one problem with the same system. Yes. And I, I always say like, you know, you could have a problem with your heart valve and then you might have a blockage in your artery. I kind of try to kind of, again, bring in something that's more familiar uh, to folks mm -hmm. to kind of help them understand because it can be confusing, especially if part of a diagnosis, and this happens with the stippler migraine as well, is, oh, you're going to rule everything else to call it that, but yet they can coax, <laughs> so it's a little challenging. Um, and the other thing I wanted yeah. to say about BBBV is we don't uh, sell these anymore, but I do still use the analogy for treatment as I'm going to play the little game with the plastic balls and the plastic maze to put your crystals back where they belong. And that's where we've got to turn your head and body certain ways. So it could be another way that people kind of relate um, to understanding what you're doing uh, for treatment. And, and again, some people might just click with this um, in, in a different way, but just multiple tools uh, is always kind of my approach uh, whenever possible. So um, I think just the last couple of things that I usually hit on with my, with uh, Meniere's disease is that you're absolutely right. Like you had said, there's a lot of overlapping um, issues that can come with Meniere's disease, whether it is migraine, you know, people with Meniere's tend to have migraine or migraine like symptoms 50% of the time. If it's bilateral Meniere's, you can, that people with bilateral Meniere's about 85% of that patient population have migraine or migraine like mm -hmm. features as well. And then you add that complication in with BPV, significantly more likely to develop that, especially if they're female. But there's also a genetic predisposition, so it can run in families. I have identical twin uncles who both started showing signs of Meniere's disease at the same exact time um, and went through the same disease process, and they both had BPV on top of that too. And you know they got the real double whammy with that. Um, but you'll hear patients say, "Oh, my mom had this, or my grandma had this, or I have a cousin that has this." You know, it is frequently uh, connected genetically. And then there's also some prevalence that look at autoimmune thyroid mm -hmm. disease. So I can't tell you how many patients I have come in that on their medication list, there's level of thyroxine or they have some history of Hashimoto's or some, you know, uh, thyroid issue. So it's very interesting to see that connection as well and kind of just goes along with the explanation I give patients where I say typically by the time I see someone for dizziness, it's more complicated and there's layers of things that we have mm -hmm. to peel back. And, you know, Mears is definitely in that, in that category, in that realm. Yeah, and I think that touches on something I forgot to have you make a slide about, but I had someone specifically email us a question, so I'm just going to go ahead and address it now because it fits. For a true bilateral loss, and this is where it gets tricky because with would both sides of the inner ear have been damaged, whether it's by veneers or by subsequent neuritis episodes or chemotherapies that you know could be damaging to the inner ear structures, whatever the cause of when both you know, vestibular uh, systems have been disrupted um, on both sides. Sometimes one's damaged. I make up numbers when I explain 50% and the other one's 20%. And I just say, this is just an example. I'm not saying that's what your percents are. And then I say, you know, so they don't agree. This is why we might get dizziness because they're not agreeing. But if both are completely damaged, which occasionally happens, it's not the majority, uh, but the true, you know, 0% information from either side, you know, how can we kind of explain that as far as our treatment approach? And, you know, again, with you mentioned so well with compensation, what's happening a little bit differently with the brain for a bilateral than a, than a unilateral, would you say? I actually have a patient I eval just last Friday. She um, 
she almost lost her life due to sepsis from a really bad UTI infection. And they put her on, uh, you know, a really, really strong antibiotic that was ototoxic to the ear. And she lost, uh, you know, complete function in both ears bilaterally. So, you know, having that conversation with her, I have to tell her, I'm not going to completely fix your dizziness and the issues that you're having. You know, if those inner ears do not have function anymore, I can't bring that back. However, there are things that we can do to substitute what that system brings to the table um, and habituate some of the symptoms that you're experiencing and come up with some functional balance activities to get you to compensate uh, and for your balance in other ways. So although I can't bring that vestibular system back and get that working properly, uh, we can figure out ways to make you more functional to give you back quality of life and utilize other systems in your body, like your visual system, your somatosensory system to kind of tell you where you are and how to move differently. So using assistive devices um, in that way to help and working on um, strategies to improve that balance, walking around their home or out in the community is very important. Absolutely. I always like to use a phrase, we're going to work with what you got. Uh, so I'll say we're going to maximize things like hip strength, which we know can help balance. You know, I just kind of talk about these are kind of some helpers um, to fill in the gap a little bit for those areas that, you know, are just maybe going to be at a level. Um, so I hear you completely, Danielle. All right. We get to switch uh, gears a little bit. Deja gets to take the stage here. Um, people come in, they have a vestibular schwannoma. Sometimes they're going to resect it, do surgery, and sometimes they're going to monitor and leave it. So we've already talked about a neuritis type hypofunction. We've talked about a Meniere's disease, which essentially creates uh, a form of hypofunction, although it's a fluctuate disorder. It generally damages at least one side. Here is a different way that someone might present uh, in a way like a hypofunction. Uh, but it has its own pathology. So how would you, in brief, explain a vestibular schwannoma to a patient who's maybe a little needing some backup explanation from what maybe their doctor gave you? Sometimes we have to just explain a little more. Yeah, yeah so um, a vestibular schwannoma, it's also referred to as an acoustic um, neuroma. There's so many names. Um, I feel like this has been called um, even an acoustic neurofibr. Broma, um, but it's benign. It's a benign um, tumor, usually slow growing, um, and it develops from the balance and hearing nerves inside of our ear, so the vestibular and cochlear nerves um, supplying the ear. And the tumor comes from an overproduction of these cells, these swan cells that normally wrap around nerve fibers and they help support and insulate the nerves. So as this tumor grows, some clinical findings that you might find is unilateral or one-sided um, hearing loss, tinnitus, so ringing in your ear, um, dizziness and loss of balance. And then if it continues to grow, it can also interfere with some of the facial um, sensation or the nerve, um, the facial nerves. And then it can also result in some numbness as well. And, and sometimes even maybe weakness to the muscles there um, and can cause paralysis sometimes, um, depending on the size of it. Right. So and then... When they oh, hear sorry. tumor, when they hear tumor, though, you say benign, mm -hmm. but it's it's you, you might want to. I'm sure you do. Yeah, ben benign, <laughs> not life threatening, like like benign. It's not um like a malignant. It's not a cancer that's going to spread to other parts of your body. Yes. It is an overgrowth of cells that is creating a little bit of an issue. Yeah, right. Like something right. like that, because people. I tell you, this is one that, you know, yeah. I've had patients really struggle with their anxiety on this, um, for right. sure. Right, Deja? Yeah, so it's definitely not life-threatening. <laughs> right. Right. So okay. we, we've kind of talked a little bit about treatment um, for hypofunction, whether, regardless of kind of root cause here. Um, and you mentioned on this slide so nicely gay stability exercises. Um, so kind of how do you explain to a patient um, why they're going to have to shake their head and make themselves feel a little extra to see? Yeah, so kind of going back to like even what Danielle said, like we're going to try to adapt you or it's going to substitute. So we're going to provide like alternative strategies to help provide for that missing piece to your vestibular system that you have. Um, so adaptation exercises, that's just um, where there's going to be some long term changes that are going to come to play in response to you moving your head so many times with the goal of reducing like the symptoms that you had before. And then hopefully we can normalize your gaze and your postural stability with that. 
while you maintain like focus on a certain target. One hundred percent. Yeah. And then um, so the we talked about the gay stability part. And then if we go down and we talk about um, maybe some of the balance training, um, that's also where we are going to alter your visuals. So we may tell you to close your eyes. So patients are like, oh, the, the my balance is completely gone away. Well, that's because we're trying to isolate the vestibular system now. And if we put you on a, a piece of foam, so we're altering the sensory input that is also coming in. So further trying to strengthen the vestibular system. And we can also change the base of support. So a lot of my patients say, well, why do I have to, I'm going to, I'm going to fail if I get pulled over by a cop or I feel drunk. Like they always <laughs> say that. I know, and right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, well, this is good for your vestibular system because we're trying to strengthen that as well. And then um, Danielle also talked about walking around the house and everything and just going outside because aerobic activity is going to be really good as well for these patients. So just got to keep moving. Yeah. um, And we're going to touch on this more than once in this talk, but there's no question that physical exercise, being physical therapists, we're very biased. But I tell you, the literature is there um, because uh, our brain and our body needs blood flow, right? So and, and the inner ear structures, especially if they have some kind of issue, even a tumor, mm-hmm. <laughs> they, you know, to have health in, in a structure, it needs to have, you know, get the nutrients coming to it to get the, you know, waste products taken away. We need that um, to kind of hopefully improve or maximize whatever health can be to those structures. So I consider that a huge piece. And for people who are very symptomatic, I will start them laying down. I don't care. You want to lay down, do leg lifts to start, whatever. I will start you somewhere um, and get some kind of blood flow. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head there. So speaking of blood flow, this is another one that really needs it. Am I right, Tasha? Yeah, yeah. So when we switch over to talking about central vestibular disorders or, or strokes, um, so we, we typically think of the results of a stroke being weakness on one side of the body. Um, however, if a stroke impacts or affects the part of the brain or the area called the cerebellum, um, then the effects can be different. So for instance, like an anterior, um, inferior cerebellar artery, uh, a stroke to that part or an occlusion there is responsible for um, carrying that blood to the back of your brain. So your balance, your coordination, the sensation of your face and body or movement of that and your body position, midline, where you feel like you are, all of those things could be just thrown off. Um, Symptoms could be dizziness, vertigo, nausea, the feeling of imbalance or being pulled to one side, um, as well as hearing loss ringing in the ears and you can start to have trouble walking. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you include the blood, the, the, the vessels in these areas, um, you can have more of the central disorders 100%. coming in. Also yeah. talks about the, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, we were going to follow that up with the, the vertebral baser insufficiency one yeah, as well. 100%. We yes. Another blood flow issue, blockage or a clot, right? So we have blockage or clot. And then, of course, for a stroke, you could also could be too much blood, a broken blood vessel that bleeds, right? So you can talk about different pathology. But at the end of the day, what I'm hearing you saying is that, you know, well, why would I have ringing in my ears? This is a great opportunity to explain to the patient, okay, it's the processing center that's broken or the, the television or the computer or whatever we want to use there to say, you know, now it seems like there's something wrong with the ear, but it's really a sensation at the brain level. Is that kind of what you're thinking. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. Awesome. And then if you want to kind of just briefly cover this, it will. Yeah. So the vertebral uh, basal insufficiency, this is the reduced or the clotting. So the stop blood flow reducing to the part of the circulation to the back of your brain. Mm -hmm. So there's two arteries that come up and supply there um, and they merge to supply this artery. So this, this again, supplies the back of your brain. It's responsible for that balance and movement. So again, if if there's any impaction here to this part, then it's going to result in those symptoms that we talked about earlier. 100%. Absolutely. All right. So you have a nice table here, generalized symptoms of peripheral and central origin. Is there anything you want to specifically point out here that you use for education for your patients? 
Yeah, I was just going to say it's a great guideline to determine, like as clinicians, the different signs and symptoms that we're going to see between per- peripheral and um, central origins mm-hmm. for vestibular. So this one right here is the symptoms. And then the next one is the signs. Awesome. Get that up too. That's a great summary. Very nice. All right. So looks like we're ready to move to, to another brain problem, but one that's even more complicated in some ways, at least strokes. I feel like people are kind of <laughs> familiar with that. Oh, it's kind of an R problem. It's like a knowing where I am problem, but it's just that processor for that part. This vestibular migraine, oh, it could get deep. So Madison, take us away here. I really liked that um, chart you had, Deja. I think that those are really good, like signs and symptoms charts. So I wanted to say that for central vestibular stuff, because we always want to know, are they having central signs because of migraine or are they having these central signs because of stroke? And that is something that can be really confusing and frustrating for a lot of people. Now, when we think about migraine, I think we all picture this person in our head who is probably our mom or friends with our mom who got a head when we were over at their house when we were kids and she went up to her room and we got a babysitter or their dad took care of us or we went to someone else's house because their mom had a headache and needed to lay down. At least that's what I picture. And I think from people who I talk to, they're like, migraine is a headache, but it is so much more than a headache. And this is something I'm very, very, you could say passionate about talking about. And vestibular migraine is considered the most common cause of recurrent spontaneous vertigo attacks that is central. So when people start to feel spinning and dizziness, and I was literally before this talk just reading an email from someone who I do not know who sent me an email about this asking, said, I am having these dizziness and panic attacks and these vertigo sensations, and they're really bizarre. I think I have a brain tumor or a stroke. And although I will never give medical advice to a person who is not my patient, statistically, we can say that it is probably vestibular migraine, especially when you throw that headache in there. Now, of course, it's always good to send your patients who you think might have a brain tumor or a stroke or something like that to get imaging. Um, But vestibular migraine truly is so, so common. Um, It accounts for 7% of patients in dizziness clinics and 9% of patients in migraine clinics. So it is a lot of people Um, and it's severely undiagnosed as well. So it's estimated about 50% of people with migraine in general um, do not know that they have migraine or they're undiagnosed or they just don't see their doctor because they're like, oh, I just get a headache or I just get this symptom. I just get that symptom. It's no big deal. Um, but it should be treated and it can be treated. So when we're talking about migraine, we want to think about a couple of specific nerves that separate it from being a peripheral dysfunction. So these are our central dysfunctions that we want to separate from peripheral dysfunctions. And we talked about at the beginning a couple of times about having a kink in the hose and something going on with that peripheral vestibular system itself, whether that's a neuritis or a BPPV or a Meniere's disease or something like that. And I typically start by giving them like an overview of their entire vestibular system, because I think saying like, this is a brain problem and this is making you dizzy and you're not processing stuff isn't really helpful because some people have heard of BPPV or Meniere's disease, or they might know what uh, some sort of weird dysfunction is like a uh, vestibular neuritis, a friend or family may have had it, but having this really chronic 24 seven dizziness, they're like, that's not possible to have anything but a stroke. So really educating your patients that this can happen for central reasons, not just peripheral reasons. Um, and that it also can present really, really, really similar to these other diagnoses. So people with vestibular their migraine have the same symptoms as positional vertigo from BPPV, and they have the same symptoms as vestibular neuritis, but it comes in these weird attacks that happen all the time. I keep getting neuritis. That's what you'll hear a lot of people say, or someone told me I had Meniere's disease, but I really don't have that low frequency hearing loss. And I think that these things are things that are more commonly talked about, but statistically, it's probably vestibular migraine. Um, You'll, they'll also get this testing and they'll say, oh, well, nothing is wrong on my testing and they can't find my brain tumor. And so I must just have one. I need six more CTs. And this is something that we see a lot. But going back to that cable system and saying, OK, your vestibular system is fine. 
your cable is okay. And the way you're interpreting this information is getting interrupted. And I kind of go through the migraine cascade, which if you are going to start seeing patients with vestibular migraine or think you might have some in your in your clinic that you might be seeing and you're like, oh, kind of like this flag going up in your head saying, oh, maybe this is that. Um, I highly recommend you read um, Victory over Vestibular Migraine by Shinbei. I think it will give you a lot of clinical pearls as well as being able to give it to your patients will be really helpful. Um, and I think this is helpful because it's such a bizarre thing that is so invisible. And again, we go back to thinking of migraine as this headache and people say, well, I don't have headaches. And the number one thing to know about that is you absolutely do not need headache in order to have a migraine diagnosis. So when we think about a migraine diagnosis, it comes on a spectrum. The spectrum is intensity and frequency. So you can have one once in your life. You can have one once a year. You can have one every single day, these attacks. And they come in lots of phases and things like that that you can really get in with your patients. But the overview is it's on the spectrum. And that spectrum also applies to the way that the symptoms present. So these um, different symptoms, can they live in your brain 24, 7, 3, 6, 5. You have migraine disorder, migraine disease. It's similar to saying how you have asthma and you have asthma attacks. A person with asthma, they live with asthma all the time. They might not be having an attack all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so migraine disease causes migraine attacks and language really matters. I think we know this more and more in 2023. And so migraines is not the term we take off that s i know we said this earlier and it's okay if it's on different stuff but we need to educate our patients that hey we are saying it's migraine disease or migraine disorder it's happening on this spectrum of symptoms where some people get head pain some people get dizziness some people will go blind for 45 minutes and have ocular migraine there's all these different kinds of it i um, mean head pain is never a requirement um, for that diagnosis. And it can also cause those 24 seven type of symptoms where people are like, well, I'm having these symptoms every day and my migraine doesn't happen every day, but it really can. And also knowing that this goes with other diagnoses. So some people will have a history of painful migraine and then they will get a vestibular neuritis. And then all of a sudden they'll have vestibular their migraine. And so now they have more than one thing. So they do have a kink in their hose and they have a decrease in function on one side, but they're also having a processing issue. And so treating both of those at the same time is going to be really important. So clinically, you will see a person have probably a potential uh, personal or familial history of migraine, light and sound sensitivity, potential for head pain, but not everyone. Um, neck and occipital pain for some people, but not everyone. That can come from a lot of different places, but you'll see it. Um, dizziness, off balance, non-spinning or spinning vertigo. Some central signs on the VNG. So people will have positional vertigo that just cannot be treated by an epile maneuver and you can't figure out why. Think vestibular migraine. Um, saccades will be off for some people. Tracking will be off for some people. It'll just make them way too dizzy for it to be neuritis. It just won't really make sense. Um, People will describe it as an internal rocking, spinning, floating, swaying. And the one that I think gets most people is I feel like I'm walking on a trampoline. Those are so many of those VM patients. Um, it will be always worse or usually worse when it, they're stressed or not sleeping well. Um, that neck pain I put on here twice because I think people are like, well, I have migraine. It can't cause neck pain. It can. Um, and then everyone is different. So if you're like, that's a really weird symptom. Is that really from a vestibular disorder? Probably. And it's I want you to think vestibular migraine. Obviously not always. And if you think this person needs imaging or more testing, always send them for it. Use your clinical decision-making. But I truly want you to think of this diagnosis because it is so, so, so common. Like 3% of the adult population or something like that has vestibular migraine. So it is a lot of people. Right. Um, and they often get really gaslit. And so it's important to understand that this is a thing. And this is perfect. I am going to go back to Deja's slides because I think people might say, oh, I have vestibular migraine, but they're slurring their speech or kind of like we, you mentioned the one of the D's. So Deja, I think mm -hmm. maybe I'll just let you go ahead and just tell us what those are as a reminder um, so we can kind of keep that in our head. What are the D's? I'm believe, sorry. I believe one of them is dizziness. Dizziness, drop attacks. Yep. Uh, oh, gosh. Dysphagia. Brain fog. Yeah? Yeah. Um, 
There's like five. Danielle, you want to jump in? Is it diplopia? Like double vision is one? Yeah. yeah. Am I missing Our any other ones, three, Madison? Yeah, Disarthria. 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 Yeah, the Disarthria. Right. Yeah, drop right. attacks and dizziness. Perfect. But also, every single one of those comes with vestibular migraine sometimes. Right. People right. get hemiplegic symptoms where they can't walk for 45 minutes or to a day. And so knowing that these people might be having a stroke and also might not be having a stroke. So send them for imaging, do your thing, treat your red flags as you would red flags, cover mm -hmm. all your bases and then say, okay, if it's none of those things and this person's presenting otherwise normally, vestibular migraine might be on your diagnostic list for sure. hundred percent. And this brings um, us, go ahead. To my second favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this brings us to our second favorite thing. Everyone's second favorite thing, right? Persistent postural yeah. perceptual dizziness. All right. Which is a secondary thing. So persistent postural perceptual dizziness is the most common cause of chronic dizziness. And the most simple way to put it, I think, is it's the dizzy, anxious, dizzy cycle gone wrong. And if you have ever seen a patient who is dizzy, you have probably also seen a very anxious and or frustrated patient at the exact same time. And when these two things process together, those nerves that fire together, wire together, and 3PD is frequently the result. Now, I get a lot of emails and a lot of referrals of people who say they have just 3PD and they absolutely could not have anything else possibly going on. And I want you to think again and read those diagnostic criteria very quickly because you're not required to have a vestibular underlying diagnosis, which is the most common reason for this, but you could have something else going on or a panic disorder or something like that that's causing 3PD. When we think about treating this, we do want to kind of think about what is, what's the reason people end up with 3PD. Um, clinically, you will see chronic dizziness that's worse usually with visual stimuli, active and or passive motion. So they'll typically be worse in the car, typically be worse when they're actively moving. And usually they'll be better lying down or sitting down. Now I will say there, we have lots of dizzy patients who cannot lie flat. They're like, well, I'm worse when I lie flat. And I think that's kind of like a talk for maybe a different time, but um, just because they have that, don't knock this one off your radar. They'll be kind of stiff and have this potential for neck pain that you're like, why is this? It's because they're probably not moving their neck and they're kind of just stiff and their motion is a little bit funky almost. Um, they're unsteady, super hyper vigilant, very in tune with their body, which can be really helpful, but also kind of detrimental. Um, and they'll have this non-spinning vertigo that's gotten worse over time. At first, maybe it was there a little bit and now it's there all the time. And they're just like, it's really impacting my ability to do things, go to the grocery store, hang out with my family, leave the house even. And people can have this for years and years and years and kind of not know why. And so that really chronic type dizziness, we do want to um, really dive into and kind of see what is going on there. Um, and then for central vestibular disorder treatment, it really depends, which is everyone's favorite and least favorite thing. Because the way you treat vestibular migraine is not always the way you treat 3PD because you're going to want to start VRT with those 3PD patients who are acute. They have vestibular neuritis maybe a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, and 90 days later, they have 3PD and they're like, oh, this neuritis kicked this off. You needed VRT. Let's do VRT now. But if you do vestibular rehab with those vestibular migraine patients who have migraine and it's not super well controlled. They don't have a headache specialist. They're not really making those lifestyle changes yet because they do not know they have this. VRT is going to make them worse almost every single time. So when you think about treating a central disorder like this, it's not, oh, it's BPPV. I can give them an Epley maneuver. Uh, vestibular neuritis, okay, they have gaze instability. Let's do VOR times one. Those vestibular migraine patients, you really want to think, how do we get this migraine under control? Is this something I'm familiar with or do I need to refer out and do some reading before I see the next one. Um, and then once that patient has their VM under control saying, okay, you have a handle on what to do when you have an attack, this is the time for VRT. And even then a lot of times VOR times one is not gonna be effective because they don't have gaze instability. So why are we doing this type of thing? Um, and for 3PD, we wanna think about cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy, one or both are great. Um, an SSRI or an SNRI for your 
patients who will agree to take a medication. Not all of them will, and that's totally fine. But for those patients who want that, um, usually for around a year, and then VRT all at the same time um, will really frequently be helpful to persistent postural perceptual dizziness. And our other shameless plug as being physical therapists is tell them all to exercise and move their body. It will help even if they do not believe you, it will. So a hundred percent. Um, and with three PD, I would just say that when I explain it to my patients, I might mention anxiety, but I'll, I'll more commonly say it's a learned dizziness. And I really focus on the fact that, you know, they're experiencing dizziness. Maybe I can sort out, like I can tell they had an old hypofunction, um, from some of the testing I can do that kind of thing. Um, they like that. They seem to like, like kind of like to have something that they can latch onto if possible. But even if I can't be sure, I can say like, look, you know, it seems like a, based on your history, it could be this or that. But at the end of the day, you know, now your brain says, oh, movement equals dizziness. And we just got to unlearn that. So that's my analogy. Um, totally. totally. Yeah. Someone taught me a really awesome analogy. She's a vestibular psychologist. Um, and it is a path through woods. And you are always going to take the paved path every single time. And you have to repave a new path because it's harder and you're always going to take the path of least resistance through the woods. Um, but if you can very intentionally take the more difficult path every single time, that will help you to unlearn this dizziness. I'm totally with you. Got it. Uh, and I wanted to give an opportunity because vestibular migraine and 3PD are both fairly common in my practice, I would say. Um, because patients come and they're like, oh, I must just have the crystal problem my neighbor had. Will you fix this? And then they can discover it's one of these other things. Danielle or Deja, if you want to add anything else on this uh, topic, feel free before we move on. This could definitely have its own uh, entire Journal Club episode, but I think Madison really did a good job of hitting it on the head and very succinctly uh, kind of dipping our toe into that rabbit hole that, you know, vestibular migraine can be. It's very, it can be very complicated and overwhelming, I think, for, for clinicians and for patients. Yeah, and still um, being like a new um, physical therapist out treating now, I do feel like some of the diagnoses um, when they come into play and some of the presentations that the patients have, like just listening and hearing all of this now, I'm kind of like, huh, well, maybe they have this or maybe they have that. It's making you want to second get or go back and like try some things to figure it out or dig a little deeper. So yeah, this is good. That's and awesome. you never stop learning. Like the resources for migraine are constantly growing, changing. The research is changing. How I treated migraine even two, three years ago yeah. is very different from how I approach now. I actually have a patient who I've worked with, um, you know, coming, you know, not too far out of school and her and I still touch base. We still do these, we catch up and we still kind of work on her symptoms. And it's amazing how much that shift has really changed over the years. So never stop learning, never stop keeping your eye on the research and be okay with the fact that things are going to change very consistently. Awesome. All right. Well, we are running short on time, but I am going to just breeze through a couple more slides before we wrap up here that I built. So um, I wanted to touch on visual vertigo. And the way I explain this to my patients is something happened with your vestibular system. It might be at your inner ear. It might be at your brain because you had a stroke in a cerebellum. But at the end of the day, what visual vertigo really means is that your brain decided, I don't trust vestibular stuff. You know, the part of the brain that handles vestibular information, the inner ear, both, whatever. And so I'm just going to say the eyes have it. The eyes are going to tell me everything I need to know. And so we sensory reweight. All of a sudden, everything the eyes says is so important. Everybody else be quiet. The eyes, eyes are giving me something. Hang on. All right. <laughs> so the downside to this for the brain, unfortunately, is then when we get into a visually busy environment, patterns, a grocery store, and there could be lighting and other things. So don't get thrown off by that. <laughs> so it could be a tricky business to identify visual vertigo. But um, the pathology underneath could be vestibular migraine, could be 3PD, could be a hypofunction. But at the end of the day, the brain's decided, I don't trust the vestibular system. And now all of a sudden patterns and other stuff is so much information. Whoa, a lot of movement, something like that. Um, visually, my brain's like, whoa. And then we get dizzy just from viewing something um, that's busy or a pattern. Um, so the brain does change. They've done studies on this <laughs> um, when visual vertigo is present. And the good news is we can try gently, depending on the root cause, to expose patients to some stimulus that might be a little bit challenging to process. 
Um, but you don't want to go to like, oh, what's the thing that really bothers you the most? Here, view this for two hours. Like, no. <laughs> okay. So this touches on a general concept of what we call habituation, which is we do a little bit of gentle, gradual exposure, maybe get a little bit of symptom bump, um, and then we let it ride down. And then this is the art of being a vestibular therapist that I feel is very challenging. Um, and still occasionally we accidentally, I think, cross a line, so to speak, not that we harm the patient, but that they end up having symptoms maybe longer than we would have liked or more impeding their function after the treatment than we would have liked. So we do have to kind of go case by case, but we're going to do frequent breaks, gradual increase in exposure, smaller chunks, pacing, 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 pacing. Maybe that's every other day for 30 seconds. I mean, you got to really figure that out. I always start way lighter than I think I need to. <laughs> and then <laughs> if that goes well... Uh, we can, they say, no, I felt fine, or I was feeling a little something, but it went away. Okay, good, then we can bump it up. On the flip side, if you've got someone after, say, a regular hypofunction, and you're like, oh, I'm going to give busy back runs as a progression, and they're like, yeah, that felt the same to me, you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time on busy back runs, because that's not necessarily something that bothers them, which is great. We don't want them to be bothered by it, but just know that that's not necessarily something that's really challenging their brain in that case. Um, and one of the things I've heard Dr. Pavlo, who is um, one of the researchers on this topic, is say that you do need to let your patients say stop at any point if they feel they cannot continue. It's not this no pain, no gain. And I think sometimes patients need to be educated on this, but they think that, you know, oh, yeah, like I got to really feel it. No, like it's a, it's, a, it's a fine line, Goldilocks level, I like to say, or, you know, you're sculpting the edges of your pottery. Like you don't need to dig, smash it. Like, you know, however analogy works for you, but... Um, same thing with motion sensitivity. So I'm sensitive to my self motion. And this is where you might do VOR at some point with someone with after concussion or even vestibular migraine on occasion, but at a gentle level to start, whatever it is that the motion you now bending over bothers me or whatever kind of self motion you think you need to kind of gradually get them more comfortable with. But I like to do it gently. I like to give them a bridge. Okay. So one of the bridges is Look with your eyes as you turn your head from object to object. That is not cheating, people. <laughs> it's giving the patient a way to start to get used to the movement before they just kind of whip their head over quickly. So, you know, giving people ability to kind of ground, plug in, um, and making it fun has been shown to also decrease symptom level in and of itself. So a lot of strategies to help. And then I have patients who are always like, oh, my gosh, are you sure it's not my neck? <laughs> well... That's a huge debate we're not getting into today, but suffice to say, a lot of people with some other vestibular problem, like vestibular migraine, let's say, have neck complaints. Or I just didn't want to move around. I go into Frankenstein mode, I like to say, which I think Madison alluded to. Um, can the neck issue by itself create dizziness? Maybe a little off balance, weird feeling. It's possible. But at the end of the day, I have to take care of a lot of people's necks anyway. Even if, like, I'm pretty sure they had BBV that we've cleared and now they just kind of still feel off, well, we just want to restore normal movement. Luckily, as physical therapists, we're very well qualified to treat the neck. So go for it <laughs> because, you know, whether it's the neck proprioceptors or the joint sensors not agreeing with our vestibular system or our eyes or not, let's just take care of the neck and make sure that it's moving well and it's strong and we've got decent posture. Um, and as far as falls, suffice to say, I do try to educate patients on stuff that we can change and stuff we can't change, right? So some things that are going to make us more likely to fall are just the fact that we are a little bit older and things like that. But that doesn't mean we can't work on it, <laughs> okay? It's not hopeless, um, but we just need to be aware of there's things we can't. If you have a vestibular hypofunction, that's pretty much it, okay? That's there, <laughs> Uh, what are the things we can change? Let's work on those things. Get you stronger. Get you more body aware. If you can learn strategy, we'll learn strategy. If not, I'll get you a balance wear vest maybe, which is a weighted vest that's specialized to the patient. you got to figure out your own treatment for each individual. And this is where individualized treatment, uh, I think we could all agree, is very important. And when we think about somebody who then gets anxious <laughs> because they've fallen, uh, this by itself is a risk factor for more falls because, again, they tend to kind of change how they have their balance strategies and so forth. So we can intervene really well here by educating our patients on their individual issues. We're going to address those. We use different handouts, videos, et cetera, which we addressed at the very beginning of this talk. We're going to apply, you know, things like, oh, you respond to an app or you want to meet with your buddy who lives up the street to take a walk, whatever works for you. Um, and exercise, exercise, exercise <laughs> can help with dizziness. 
and reducing, you know, things like BVV can absolutely reduce risk for falls. And the fact that you don't have to do VOR like with an X, it can be like something fun that they want to look at. Um, you know, so really get creative, especially piece with cognitive issues. You might have to kind of stimulate their head movements differently than someone who can follow instructions. And don't forget to work on spatial issues, path negotiation. Again, make it fun. Find your way from A to B. You can do this in the home as well. Um, and I am going to just kind of say that in general, our best prognosis, if your patient asks, is this going to come back? Am I going to get better? <laughs> uh, the brain is a learning machine. So any brain problem, yes, we can get this to a point. I can't say you're going to be perfect, <laughs> but I know there's room for improvement because the brain is amazing. Uh, number two, uh, sooner we work on this, the better. <laughs> That's pretty much true of any condition. Definitely hypofunction. We have literature on that for sure. And then BBBV, we can put them back, but they might come out again. But I'm more stubborn than any crystals, and I will keep putting your crystals back, my friend. And that's how I educate people on caring for BBBV. Um, so, you know, good news is even something like a hypofunction can take up to a year. So don't be like, you know, permanently say, oh, this is never going to get better just because it's been some period of time since your initial issue. Be open to the brain changing. And there's tons of tools out there. You can print your own otoconia. You have a 3D printer, look on our website. We have instructions on that. You can make your own vestibular fluid apparatus if you have access to buying um, what's a, uh, all the supplies are listed on our website. And if you can't afford to buy your own, otherwise I do say go ahead and buy your own. If that's easier for you, I support that too. You can buy other tools. There's courses out there. Um, and I did paint these and you can buy them online if you want. This is <laughs> how into vestibular I am. So true confessions. All right, so how you educate matters. I know this took way longer than an hour and I apologize to everyone who's watching. If you stuck with us this long, props to you. This is what happens when you get four people together who really, really love to educate patients on their vestibular conditions. I hope whoever does watch this finds some piece of it or all of it useful to you. Um, but keep getting creative, use your different tools, use what you have access to. Um, and our speakers are overqualified and amazing and brilliant. And please check out all their resources. And I'll just let each one say, if there's any one thing on your slide, Deja, that you want to really point out, feel free to speak up. I think we have it. <laughs> <laughs> Not much to point out there. It's just a summary of different things. Um, what I do now and then um, some of the publications. So outside of vestibular, I do do a lot of minority work and advocacy for the field. Um, but yeah, advocating for vestibular is always big, too. <laughs> I love that. And Madison, anything you want to highlight here? Yeah. Uh, September 15th, my podcast is coming out. So I don't know. I think this that was after this. I don't know what day it is, frankly. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> yes, that's after this. Today is in August, Madison. Um, it's going to call, be called Grounded, the Vestibular Podcast. It's great for patient education. So if you are a person who's like, I don't know, I'm having trouble educating my patients and I want also to educate myself and refer them somewhere um, that is easy and free and they can listen, which sometimes reading and watching is hard. So mm. listening is my next best thing. And then give me a follow at the Vertigo Doctor everywhere. Awesome. Danielle, anything you want to pull off from this slide? <laughs> Mine is pretty much covered uh, in terms of fun resources for all you vestibuloholics out there. Be sure to check out Vestibular uh, Versus website. Um, look at all their fun tools, whether it's their uh, really neat anatomically correct uh, fluid filled headband to the functional inner ear. We even have jewelry out there, which are true to size. So you can literally wear your educational material on your body and really nerd out. Um, but make sure to check all that out. Um, and the other great resources mentioned throughout this entire uh, journal club. This is absolutely amazing. Thanks for having us. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you all join us next month. We'll be talking about dysautonomia and concussion. So more vestibular conditions ahead. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, ladies, for your contributions. You're brilliant. And everyone, take care. Thanks. Bye.